From Software's game design changed everything. From Software's game design has had a undeniable and profound effect on not only the gaming industry, but the industry of uh, Jacobs, the, of it, people named Jacobs, such as myself. With the massive success of Elden Ring, From Software has further established that a merciless, uncompromising gameplay first design philosophy with little hand holding or assistance can also still be a massive success that millions of people will connect with and absolutely adore. I am certainly one of those millions. And while typically nice. brilliant, I also believe that From Software's games are unfortunately far from perfect, and Elden Ring is sadly no exception. And I want to talk about it. But first, I must warn you that I will be spoiling the absolute Moonlight Greatsword out of all of these games, so if you haven't experienced them for yourself, particularly Elden Ring, I strongly suggest you hit pause on this video and go savor that experience first and come back in about 200 hours because it is quite possibly the greatest experience I have had playing a video game in my 28 years of holding a Player 2 Mad Cats controller that isn't actually plugged in. Regardless. Uh, no. I haven't played a single Souls-like game uh, just because I'm, like, too afraid to, like, like s put the time sink in or whatever, so, like, beating my head against the keyboard. And if I were to play a Souls-like game, it would probably be Elden Ring first. But I just want to hear what he has to say because I just think this is really interesting. You know, this is just another video hyping up it seems hyping up elden ring so i'm i'm excited i want to see i believe it is no exaggeration to say that in the world of video games from software has truly changed everything Demon's Souls was released in 2009 for the PlayStation 3 and was nothing like other big games coming out at the time, especially in 2009. In a year where games were becoming more and more cinematic and accessible and forgiving to a casual audience, Demon's Souls- That was me. I was a casual audience and I loved every moment of it crawled out of a wet crypt and said, I will kill you. Demon Souls, like all the Souls games that came after it, is a very challenging and unforgiving video game. A difficulty that fans of the series often lovingly refer to as hard, but fair. Oh my God. Hmm. That's so fair. So let's, let's maybe settle on hard, but mostly fair. After so fair, miles of fairness. You're joining FromSoft in 2004 and working as a coder on the Armored Core series, Hidetaka Miyazaki took over as director on a struggling high fantasy project that was running into some serious issues during development. Because the project was already seen as a failure inside the studio, Miyazaki was basically like, I'm gonna take this thing and I'm gonna take it in, I'm gonna take it out back to the garage. I'm gonna do some stuff to it. Inspired by FromSoft's own Kingsfield series, Miyazaki wanted to make a dark fantasy gameplay-driven experience in collaboration with Sony Japan Studio. A challenging but rewarding experience that took gaming back to its basics, something he felt was dying out at the time. During development, Miyazaki actually Fair. tried to keep the harsh difficulty aspect on the low from publisher Sony, fearing that they might wanna change it for being a bit too extreme. Okay, so I... 100% understand why he would try to keep the difficulty um, like on the down low because he easily probably could have implemented like difficulty settings, you know, like easy, normal, hard or whatever. But from my understanding, all the Souls like games, there is no difficulty slider. It's just the game, uh, which is something, you know, you could say something for that uh, on its own. But I honestly, I think that's a really good idea. Um, so for me, uh, at least in like, since I've discovered like aim training, um, there wasn't really a, like a game it, only in the last couple of years, there wasn't really like, a, a game or whatever that, uh, I was super excited to like play or whatever, or like, there wasn't like a, like a ranking system for like shooters. Oh, but, well there was or whatever, but like for the most part, I was like a casual, um, and then ever since I discovered like aim training, it's only you versus yourself, which is like, in my opinion, like the greatest competition that you can have, um, you know, trying to overcome your best score, uh, essentially is what that is. And, and I think in RPGs, um, there wasn't really that same level 
of competition, I think. Um, or difficulty against like like oneself or whatever. Um so, you know, in like aim training, you know, you have like your your bronze, silver, gold, what is it? Uh platinum, diamond, jade, master, grandmaster, and so on and so forth. Um, with like difficulties and like scores and whatnot. But for RPGs, I think the Souls like games were like the first games to just have like a stamp of like, it's this hard. You have to be this good to beat the game. And whereas before, you know, traditionally RPGs are just like, uh, okay, you know, there's level one, level two, level three, you get, you kill some dudes, you get some loot, you get some level ups, you get some powers, you get some skill points, whatever like a gradual progression and for the most part like all the souls like games are, are pretty much like that but it's a different kind of skill when you have to read a mob's attack pattern and you know utilize all your tools to like overcome that boss or whatever with like dodges parries whatever else you got and i think i think it was a good thing for the rpg community because you know for the most part like the rpgs that i played um uh th like most notably Skyrim or whatever like y the games let you let the player become so powerful that like most RPG games like the actual game isn't that difficult anymore and it's just a matter of you it, it becomes more of like a tour a tourism thing you know you just go through the game you're super powerful at like i don't know 20 30 hours in or whatever maybe 50 and once you reach like a X amount of like power, you're just cruising, you know, casually. And there's nothing wrong with that or whatever. But for the Souls games, uh, they wanted to have like a more, it seems, a more linear experience as opposed to something that's like exponential or whatever in difficulty. Much like a BMX riding video game that sucked. Breaking down the basic gameplay of Demon's Souls will effectively break down the basic gameplay for all of the Souls games that followed because the very core design pillars have gone largely unchanged. It starts with a character creator that before you say anything, I know, it, it gets better with time, that lets Bruh. you pick a starting class, <laughs> dictating your capabilities with different weapons or magic. A third person lock on camera system for combat that improves mm -hmm. on the Z targeting system that Aqua arena of time introduced back in uh oh, oh, oh of nine eight that you can control the camera and attack people at the same time which was kind of a breakthrough in and of itself animation based combat that requires you to commit to each action and wait until the animation finishes before you yeah. can do something else along with managing how that action affects your stamina bar or in the case of casting spells your you know it, it kind of reminds me all these little bullet points he's listing off it kind of reminds me of like a 3d fighter but in, you know how like Tekken is like kind of 3D, but you know, you view it from a profile. Um, it's kind of like you took the camera from Tekken and you just flipped it and put it like on the person's back. And there's not as much canceling, like animation cancels or whatever, but you know, the same concept still is still there magic bar but i didn't raise you to cast no spells this is a claim over household just like my father and his father before him a dodge roll that contains invincibility frames or iframes meaning that if you time your dodge right nothing can possibly hurt you similar to action games like devil may cry corpse running where if you right. die you drop all the currency you've racked up from killing enemies and you got to make it back to that spot without dying otherwise you lose it forever passive and non-passive online interaction where other players mm -hmm. can leave helpful tips or uh, whatever the opposite of a helpful tip is, along yeah. with summoning or being <laughs> summoned as a random cooperator to help or invasions to either kill or be I killed. Kill you. And you know, the gameplay of each <laughs> individual Souls game obviously goes a lot deeper than that with different complex systems and healing items and stupid convoluted bullshit like world tendency that you need a fucking master's degree to understand. What? But the challenging and methodical combat system, that has always been the beating heart of all of these games. Right. A heart that's married to a, another heart. Exploration. Oh. You know how in my Rockstar's game design video, I really harp on how those games Even constantly ball, berate dude. you with hyper-specific instructions and yellow map markers and assume you have the IQ of a tiny baby rat? Yeah, the Souls games do like the exact polar opposite. The tiny baby rat is now actually a boss and you have no idea what the f*** 
fuck is going on. And what makes exploration so Bro, compelling in Demon Souls and really all Souls games is that it is true exploration that really makes you feel like Batman. No, it really makes you feel like an explorer. There is no detailed map that you can rely on and consult, only your own sense of direction and understanding of a space. This, along with a strong challenge and an actual fear of having something to lose with the corpse running system, makes discoveries and victories feel that much more meaningful and rewarding. Because you really feel like you, the player, actually charted and conquered a space and overcame a significant challenge instead of just watching fucking Wally do it in a cutscene. The Souls games have very few cutscenes or long unskippable passages of dialogue by NPCs or RPG conversation trees where <laughs> your choice actually doesn't really matter. Instead, the story is discovered and slowly unraveled by the player through observing their environment and reading item descriptions and inevitably watching Vati Vidya videos because I don't understand any of this. So you're oh, saying Jesus. the rat was like a king at some point or? I appreciate Miyazaki's what? approach to storytelling though because it's very unique to the medium of video games and was actually inspired by his real life experience of reading English language sci-fi and fantasy books as a kid that he couldn't <clears> fully understand but would fill in the gaps using his imagination. The story is so much more about the general mood and atmosphere and feeling of exploring a place rather than scripted plot points or set pieces. The innovative online elements of summoning random strangers to help you out was actually inspired by Miyazaki's real life as well, where after his car was trapped in snow on a hill, a random group of strangers showed up and helped push the car out of the snow and then mysteriously <laughs> drifted off into the night like ghosts drifting in and out of his world at a poorly framed pace 30 frames per second. These games also have some technical issues. Demon's Souls was not an immediate success. Sony decided to oh, not man. publish it in North America really? after feeling pretty negatively about it before its release. During the no Tokyo idea. Game Show in 2008, Sony president Shuei Yoshida played it for two hours couldn't get past the starting area and then stopped playing and said, this is an unbelievably bad video game. That's a skill issue if I ever seen one. <laughs> This is the same guy that years later would Platinum Bloodborne, and that game is like way harder, so spoiler alert, from software changed everything, the titular line. It wasn't until later in 2009 when Atlas would publish the game in North America that sales would slowly start to pick up and critics Ooh. would start to take notice. Western audiences generally loved it because apparently we're all sick, masochistic bastards, and GameSpot even gave it their game of the year, the same year Dang. that Uncharted 2 and Modern Warfare 2 came out. But It seems... I don't know why it, it did like so bad over there when in the like the Western world, or at least in the US, it did like so great. Which is like what year did he say? Like 07, 08, or 90? No. PlayStation 3. God. Oh, whatever. It's still, it's like at the time, players, it seems, were craving something difficult to just overcome or whatever. And, and this wasn't even in the era or, or even in the birth of the live service game. This was pre-live service. Bro, could you imagine if any Demon Souls titles, or not Demon Souls, any Souls likes became like some sort of live service, always online game where, I mean, I, I don't know if it's always online right now or whatever, but like, you know, you buy the, the Soul, new Souls like game. There's a battle pass, a super battle pass, a giga battle pass, a store full of cosmetics, and you still get those little tips on the ground, and you see like this like ultra fucking super saiyan a fiery dude that's like he does like the little animation or whatever or however it goes, and you're like, oh wow, he looks awesome. How does he look so awesome? Oh, let me go into the store. I want to look like him. Could you imagine that? Or imagine if they injected any form of pay to win in this genre. <laughs> oh my god. But along with establishing the core pillars of what a Souls game would be, it's important to talk about just how brave Miyazaki from Software and Sony Japan Studio were for making such a different kind of game. Demon's Souls was a huge risk, an imperfect, weird, brutal passion project that was expected by everyone to flop but refused to compromise on its design goals and eventually found an audience that really connected with it. In two console generations later, an extremely faithful remake was published published by Sony as a launch title for the PlayStation 5. And there you have it. Woo. That's uh that's it. That's the good end. video. 
Great video. Game. It's the only game they ever made. Aww. I love Dark Souls. But I also hated Dark Souls. My brother Isaac had played Dark Souls sometime after its release in 2011 and had repeatedly told me to play it. I eventually Ooh. finally tried it, uh, got past the tutorial section after a lot of struggling, Dang. made it to Firelink Shrine, wandered the wrong way into a graveyard full of skeletons, as I know a lot of people did. That graveyard eventually became a dark tunnel of skeletons that uh, killed me a bunch of times, and then I promptly said F this game and stopped playing. Aww. I can't remember for what exact reason, but a year or two later, I tried the game again, probably because of my brother's insistence once again, the bastard he is, and uh, it was different. This time, it stuck. Not only did it stick, but it seriously changed my life. I know that sounds super dramatic, but like, it completely changed the way I look at video games and why I like to play them and made me want to talk about them more and examine them. And it absolutely ruined most other video games for me because oh. once I finished it, nothing could fill the giant rat boss size. Ah, oh, there goes the mic. In my heart. Now, if I were to go into <laughs> all of the reasons why Dark Souls is so significant in gaming history, we would be here all day and my editor would absolutely hate that. I am going to kill you. But on my road to eventually talking about Elden Ring, I do need to touch on three crucial aspects that vastly improved on Demon Souls game design. Super Exploration DX Turbo Edition with fuckles. Estes Flask, what? I hardly know her as best as I can. And Atmosphere, Atmosphere, you've been seen. I feel you inside my screen. <laughs> I, I also didn't like that. What I mean what? by Super Exploration DX Turbo Edition with fuckles is that Dark Souls fundamentally changed how level design and world design worked within this gameplay formula that Demon Souls established. Bro, was that screen? Like, hold on. Where is it? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Uh... Super Exploration DX Turbo Edition with fuckles is that Dark Souls fun- Is this, like, supposed to be, like, an actual, like, little area of Dark Souls or something? Holy shit, dude. Like, it, it does- Is this, like, what I'm supposed to, like, look forward- look, Like, look forward to? Look at all the balls! What are these balls everywhere? What? Big Hat Logan. What? What are the, what are the tiny balls? Ricard? Oh, the balls are enemies? They're like big notable enemies? Or, oh, the red ball is a boss? It's like a, a little tiny red ball? So just like a tiny boss or something? I don't know. God dang. Like, generally, like, when I go through a game, in your head, or at least in my head, I can kind of keep track of like where I've been because it, like as I go forward, I, there's like a little hologram uh, like this like sets place or whatever. And it's like, OK, I've been here. If I take a left here, I can go left there. I can go back and make a right. Um, you know, there's an up another like a set of stairs, another set of stairs. But bro, look at like zooming out and looking at this. This is crazy. Like, holy shit fundamentally changed how level design and world design worked within this gameplay formula that Demon Souls established. While Demon Holes over here had a hub world that let you freely fast travel to different zones of varying locales and difficulty mm -hmm. levels, Dark Souls over here took a lot of its zones and stacked them on top of each other like a stack of pancakes and oh God. made sure that even if some pancakes have chocolate chips or some pancakes have bananas, oh. that they all seamlessly flow into each other and make sense as one cohesive world in this beautiful interconnected short stack of pancakes that's actually like a cool idea for an rpg whereas you contrast that against something like skyrim which is just like flat open plain with like you know there's like mountains and shit and then you know you go into this instance there's a dungeon you know it has like its little own thing or whatever the entirety of dark souls is just the tower of pancakes that is something I have never experienced before. The blight town is like a pancake made out of pigeons. 
During the first half of the game, you have no fast travel, and all of the areas are connected in multiple complex ways like a maze. So there's this palpable sense of danger and tension that slowly rises as you venture deeper and deeper into this beautiful, mysterious world that is very clearly inspired by Berserk, which is amazing. That uh, yes, that's that's a dub. That tension is brilliantly paired with the new addition of bonfires. Resting points that let you catch your breath for a second and spend your hard-earned currency from fighting enemies and bosses on leveling up your stat points and refilling your much-needed Estus Flask. I am of the pretty firm opinion that the healing mechanics found in Demon Souls and Bloodborne and kind of Dark Souls 2 are vastly inferior to the standard Estus Flask system found in the other Ooh. Souls games. The Estus is there like like two factions of audience like like enjoyers that are like i enjoy these older games because it was harder to heal versus i enjoy the new games because it's easier to heal it's not as hardcore but it's more quality of life is there like a little gatekeep like divider right there <laughs> has a specific amount of healing charges that you can increase throughout the course of the game. And the only way to refill your charges is by resting at a bonfire, which also respawns all enemies in the I area. Not only does this oh. provide an extra incentive to seek out and discover bonfires okay. and push on while exploring, but it solves the dumbass problem those other games have where your healing items are a finite currency that you can run out of. Meaning that if- It's like the games, the older games, we're on like super hardcore, but the newer games with the Estus Flask, it's like hardcore light. If you're struggling with the game and you keep dying, and you will, you will likely have to halt progression just to go grind mobs of weaker enemies for healing items or currency that you can then spend on healing items and not leveling up, which feels so unnecessarily punishing in a Dang. game where enemies do this to you. With the Estus, you at least know that for the next bit, you have a guaranteed specific amount of heals. And much like a survival horror game, the goal is to get to the next area using as little estus as bestus you can. I think one of the <gasps> <laughs> Okay, so I tried to play the older like Resident Evil 1 games. Like 1 and 2. I didn't even get past 1 because I was even following a guide, but I misread the guide and I forgot to do this one thing. And I came to a point where it was like, "Oh, you need this thing." But I realized what how far back it was and I was just like Oh, hell no. I'm not doing this shit. And it was super hard to get healing items in that game. So I was just like, I'm over this. This is dumb. So yeah, I could completely understand why the older Dark Souls games or Souls likes were extremely hard. Greatest single improvements over demon holes over here is the atmosphere. I will never forget how it felt to get lost in this world. Struggling my ass off through Undead Burg and Undead Parish and finally being rewarded by finding that shortcut back to Firelink Shrine and hearing that comforting music creep in. That that seriously changed the trajectory of my firstborn son's life. He's, he's getting into brown now. Journeying <laughs> all the way down to first the depths and then Blight Town, and then finding the entrance that's a secret to the Great Hollow, and making my way down that, and finally ending up at Ash Lake gave me a feeling that I will forever cherish. The inability to easily fast travel back up to Firelink Shrine after I journeyed all the way down there simultaneously had me terrified and also in complete awe of the vertical scope of this world. And there's nice. so much of this game that you can just completely miss. From Software doesn't care if every player sees all of the content that they made for this game and that makes finding the stuff that you do find feel that much more special and memorable. I know it's just all smoke and mirrors and code and textures, but the illusion that From Software sells here is a powerful one. Except for some clearly unfinished areas towards the end of the game, but those don't exist. You made Lost Isolith up. Gaslight, gaslight, gaslight. Unlike Demon what? Souls, Dark Souls was a pretty instant success. Critics loved it, and the game reached a much larger audience right off the bat, thanks to Bandai Namco publishing it all over the world on PS3 and Xbox 360 and PC, Dang. with one of the most janky PC ports to ever exist. Shout oh, out no. Games for Windows Live, RIP. This 
also <laughs> annoyingly led. I remember, I remember that. What was that? Uh, the PC Microsoft for Windows bullshit. Bro, the one game that I played back in the day, like Xbox for PC or whatever the fuck, it was called Shadow Run, but it wasn't like the normal Shadow Run. It was like this, like, what was it? 6v6 Shadow Run with like elves, dwarfs, trolls, and like a couple other classes. And that was the first time that I played a game with crossplay. And I really liked the gameplay. It, that's this is just like an aside. It, he just brought that up and it triggered that or whatever. But where's the remake for that? That's what I'm waiting for. Led to so many industry heads resorting to the phrases, "It's like Dark Souls" or "This is the Dark Souls of blank." When in reality, all they're trying to say is that it's hard. Going to Arby's yeah. is like the Dark Souls of going to Carl's Jr. Hollow Knight yeah. is very <laughs> clearly inspired by From Software's approach, and that game is undoubtedly the greatest Metroidvania ever made. I fucking love Hollow Knight, primarily because it perfected a design aspect from Dark Souls 1 that From Software themselves kind of started to abandon with subsequent Souls games non-linear exploration shut up already jesus that guy loves to talk hi uh -oh. i'm jakey jakey and jakey attorneys at law here at jakey jakey and jakey we have a lot of expenses and a lot of those expenses are <laughs> monthly subscriptions that we totally forget we're even paying for well today's sponsor rocket money is here to help rocket money is an all-in-one finance platform that i actually have rocket more money and spend less this personal finance app allows you to manage subscriptions lower bills build a custom budget, and grow your savings all in one place. We personally use it to identify and securely cancel recurring charges or unwanted subscriptions, all with the simple tap of a finger, which is a godsend for the social anxiety of having to actually call people on the phone to cancel stuff. What is this, 1882 Columbus sailed the oceans <laughs> 11? We also use it to track our monthly spending and set budgets. Rocket Money notifies us if we oh, exceed man. that budget, along with showing our spend to earn ratio every month, quarter, or year. Also, if you're like us and gonna turn 29 this year, maybe you're starting to pay a little bit more attention to your credit score. Well, right oh, I thought it was gonna say health. Never mind. Rocket Money alerts you of important <laughs> changes to your score and also offers you insights on ways you could improve your score as well. To save more and spend less, join the 3.4 million members using Rocket Money. <laughs> We've got the hookup. Go to rocketmoney.com slash nakyjakey or click the link in the description to get started for free or unlock even more features with premium. That's rocketmoney.com slash nakyjakey to get started for free. Get your money right! All right, now let's get on back to Naked Jake in the... Bro, he completely nailed that little segue because a lot of commercials that are like homemade or whatever the the guys on there do a lot of like hand bullshit or whatever so he completely just nailed that all right so good job <laughs> curious case of the floating rake <laughs> with this guy this guy never even beat digimon world 2 that's a real souls game i'm out of here bro i never beat digimon to, like either I remember for Digimon, like the first one that came out for, I think it was PS1 or whatever. Um, me and my buddy Alex would const, we would always constantly play that game and always try to get like a leveled up, what was it Greymon or whatever that you leveled up from an Agumon? Um, we never got him because you had to, I, I, I don't think the internet was like, Rel like really relevant back then and i don't remember if if we had the guide i don't think we had the guide like the prima like guide or whatever for the game it essentially just tells you how to get everything and do everything we never did that so whenever we like went up to like fight something um it would always be like this fucking champion or ultimate level monster versus our stupid piddly level like rookie monster and we would always wonder like what the fuck we're doing wrong <laughs> that game was so hard
Dark Souls 2, Bloodborne, and Dark Souls 3 all have much more straightforward progression paths than the first half of Dark Souls 1. And while a lot of areas in these games are technically connected and sometimes offer alternate paths, the general world design is far less interesting from a exploration point of view. And it doesn't mean that these games are bad. All of these games probably each deserve their own 40 minute feature presentation breaking them down, but for the sake of what I want to get into today, I'm just going to give you the SparkNotes version. Dark the e rain Dark Souls 2 dropped in 2014 and was received well and sold well. It further grew the Souls game community and deepened combat systems while adding stuff like power stances. Miyazaki didn't direct this one and it does show. The atmosphere of each zone feels a bit random and unconnected from the overall world, but the boss fights and DLCs are great and the game enjoyed a large online community for shit like PvP. Bloodborne was developed alongside Dark Souls 2 and was released exclusively oh. for the PS4 in 2015, and I used money from a car accident to buy a <laughs> PS4 and- Hell yeah, dude! That's how you do it! Bloodborne instead of paying my rent, and contrary to what my financial advisors might be saying, and, and Logan Roy looking ass, I'd say it was a wise investment. Directed Hell by Miyazaki, yeah, dude. Bloodborne felt like the true follow-up to Dark Souls 1. At least for people like me that just want to swing a big sword and fucking parry everything. Bye-bye magic, go back to fucking Waverly Place. <laughs> Faster combat that rewards <laughs> aggressive play. Intricate and varied weapon movesets. An atmosphere that just drips out of your TV with such dedicated attention to detail and talent in the art design department and rats. Dark Souls 3 dropped in 2016 and by <laughs> At this point, the Souls series was popping and beloved by many people. Directed once Dang. again by Miyazaki, DS3 did everything right on paper. It kept some of the faster paced combat and fucked up enemy designs and boss transformations from Bloodborne while also returning an Bro, okay, so I got a thing. When either like a Pixar movie or a DreamWorks like 3D movie makes their characters or like a Hotel Transylvania is kind of like this. Like all these digital movies have this have these like characters, like models or whatever. And anytime that there's like like models with like long lanky limbs, like legs and arms, and just move weird, I always think they should be a part of like the Souls like universe because a lot of the monsters in like the Souls games have this like spider quality to them like long skinny limbs it just you know you don't know what they're gonna do you know this guy he's all over here like <clears throat> like that or whatever you don't know like which way he's gonna like whip his arms around or whatever so i always thought like certain 3d movies are just like kind of just inherently creepy or like maybe unintentionally creepy that, that have like the long skinny legs long skinny arms it's just it's a thing for me or whatever so okay that's enough expansive armory of weapons and magic lending to a buttload of different kinds of builds it has a large amount of fan service and callbacks to dark souls 1 and some of the hardest bosses seen in a souls game yet it also just feels really really good to play and looks beautiful but also, something about this formula was starting to feel just a little bit stale. Formulaic is the word you're looking for. Too formulaic. Don't get me wrong, playing through Dark Souls 3, especially doing co-op boss fights with my brother, was some of the most fun I've had in any of these games. But that strong sense of exploration felt in Dark Souls 1, that feeling of charting your way through a mysterious and dangerous world, I longed for that. The Dark Souls series had completely shaken the game industry and clearly inspired other developers to change how their games were designed and played. Oh, yeah. But playing Dark Souls... Essentially, just make that shit harder, dude. D stop treating your players like little kindergartners, you know? They can beat their heads against their, against their screens, throw their controllers, go buy another one, you know? They'll do whatever they have to to beat the game, all right? three felt a bit like listening to from software's greatest hits versus hearing the band's new album that would maybe take them someplace new Ooh. little did i know from software was in the studio working on their in rainbows as in the album in rainbows by radiohead as in radiohead's best album as in elden ring oh baby Some of you might be wondering, Jacob Matthew, 
Why did it take you so long to make a video on Elden Ring? And I have two answers for you. A, last year I was very busy working on an album called Romcom. Shout out jakeymerch.com. And B, this game is just too damn big and felt too daunting to dissect and talk about. And I also just wanted to keep playing it, but I feel like I'm finally ready to get into it with my support group. Uh, that's you. This is you. this is all of you. Where do no, I even that's begin? Me. Elden Ring isn't perfect, but that's also what makes it so compelling. It's not properly balanced. I mean, none of these games are. They never have been. FromSoft has pretty clear favorites when it comes to certain weapons and buffs and spells. You can abs- The big sword. It's the big sword. That's, that's the good weapon, the big sword. Absolutely break these games in half if you really want to. But the sheer depth of content that Elden yeah. Ring slowly unveils to you during your 200 or so hours of playing it. Dragon's the childhood there. fantasy of exploring a fantastical, magical world filled with swords and beasts and, you guessed it, rats, is fully manifested <laughs> in a way that rats. knows no contemporary. There is no other Elden Ring than Elden Ring. This isn't just the Dark Souls of Dark Souls. This is the Dark Souls of Breath of the Wild. This is the Dark Souls of Red Dead Redemption 2. If you took a time machine back to 2003 and showed my wooden sword in the backyard swinging ass that this <laughs> is what was coming in the future, I would have shot you in the head and called the cops. Elden Ring is truly the adventure of a lifetime. But because I've already spent so much time Dang. talking about the core design pillars that all all of these games share. I want to instead focus on certain pillars that Elden Ring innovates on or potentially fails to innovate on. Exploration and scale, dungeons and dragons, starring Chris Pine, and difficulty and accessibility. Where Dark Souls 1's world is like a short stack of pancakes all connected, Elden Ring's world is like a giant stack of pancakes and you took all those pancakes and you spread them out across a giant table. And most of the pancakes are touching each other and some of the pancakes have other pancakes hiding underneath them Ooh. and other pancakes might transport you to far pancakes in <laughs> up ways That's and some of the pancakes are on fire. And what is this fucking pancake analogy? <laughs> And make you feel fear. I don't want to be in this Denny's anymore. Let me out. Miyazaki has stated that Elden Ring is the closest thing to his ideal game that he would personally like to play. And that going open world enriches this ideal experience that he's trying to achieve. A game where if you saw something over there, you could actually go over there. A game that isn't open world just to be in the same category as some bloated Ubisoft bullshit, but a game that's open world <laughs> because it needs to be. In order to fully capture the fantasy of being an adventurer in a giant world, riding across a vast landscape on your trusty steed, you first need to have that vast landscape to really nail that feeling. Elden Ring was yeah. inspired by Breath of the Wild and it very clearly shows because like Breath of the Wild, Elden Ring knows and expects that your curiosity will naturally lead you to finding interesting things. There doesn't need to be an overwhelming list of things to check off or obvious map markers going over here. It's fucking over here. Because that would totally rob the player of a true sense of mystery and discovery when exploring this massive world. Elden Ring is very okay with fuck? hiding its hand. This is what the map looks like when you start the game. And this is what it looks like when you finish the game. That's awesome. And these are the pancakes that are cooking underneath you the entire time. Having a chest throw a smoke grenade at you in the starting area and being transported and waking up in one of the most giant late game areas and checking the map and seeing it zoom out like that was an experience I will never forget. And the lore behind the lands between is so rich in detail and intrigue. Miyazaki's style of storytelling through gameplay combined with the Bible of world history that George R. R. Martin developed for this game will leave mm -hmm. an MF feeling like goddamn Amy Adams, as in downright enchanted. I know I haven't mentioned Sekido once in this video because it's technically not a Souls game, but it was a crucial stepping stone towards Elden Ring's development. The addition of a dedicated jump button may sound like a simple thing, but it completely changes combat in the way you navigate this world. Exploring the lands between over like 200 hours rivaled the experience I had exploring the first half of Dark Souls 1. They both hit really hard, but 
for different reasons. The first half of Dark Souls 1 hits hard because of a lack of a fast travel safety net, meaning you become very intimate with your surroundings and the world design nearly suffocates you with its complexity. It suffocates in a good way. <laughs> Elden yeah. Ring hits hard not only because it marks the return of multiple areas connecting to each other with a very non-linear path of progression, but because of just the sheer scale of the world. But because the sheer scale and intrigue of always wanting to see what's around the next corner is such a big part of this experience, much like Breath of the Wild, the game won't ever hit quite as hard on subsequent playthroughs because that main draw of discovery is no longer there. This doesn't mean you shouldn't play multiple playthroughs of this game because oh my god weapons and spells and armor sets and ashes of war and summoning summoning salt videos quest lines that you can super easily miss and you will because they're super convoluted and it's it seems like uh all the ring is a really good game that he really likes hard to follow you should definitely play the game a second time but i will say that on my second playthrough i definitely wasn't as eager to revisit all of the content once i knew what was exactly around every corner elden ring has a massive amount of unique and amazing content to experience but there's also some super not amazing content in there too in joseph anderson's review which is great by the way he talks about how amazing his first fight with a dragon was and i completely agree that first encounter with a dragon dragon in that big ass wet field or whatever and he's like breaking all of the physics objects it's amazing it's such an awesome gameplay moment that is just naturally experienced in your exploring of the world but i also agree with joseph's point that because the game ends up having like a billion other dragons that you find there's seriously so many dragons and they all mostly have the same move set it kind of takes away a bit of the oomph of that first experience it i mean that is a fair point but it's like Come on, dude. How how much different can you get with like a dragon? Like a move set or whatever. Even if you take something like uh like Monster Hunter and all the dragon types they got in Monster Hunter, it's still like for the most part you're fighting a fucking dragon. Um or or I think an even worse offender to this is is Skyrim, you know? Like the very first time you fight a dragon in Skyrim, um uh, it's awesome or whatever. But then you keep going and going, and then like by the end of the game, you fought like a couple hundred dragons, and it's like you already know the move set to each one. You know, don't get in front of them, don't get bit, because if you get bit, it, it's like an insta kill or whatever. So yeah, it doesn't mean that first experience is invalidated or made bad, but more so, it's like if you ate pizza for dinner every night, and eventually you were like, all right. I don't really want to eat dragon pizza anymore. Yeah. Can, can we have like rat pizza, mom? The same goes <laughs> for a lot of Elden Ring's catacomb dungeons. Similar to the chalice dungeons in Bloodborne or the shrines in Breath of the Wild, the quality of experience you might have in one of these copy-paste interiors is a bit of a dice roll. In all of the Souls games, you That's never know exactly what items you're going to find as rewards while exploring, but the areas and bosses are usually so interesting to look at and explore that the real reward is really just getting to experience that area and fight that cool boss. So even if the reward is something you're never going to use, like another fucking spell, you don't really regret doing it because it was a really fuck? cool experience. The same does not apply to Elden Ring. All of these catacombs are not created equally. Some will have a cool and unique boss and a really useful piece of loot. And others will have a boss you've already seen a bunch of times and an item that you will forget about the same second you leave the catacomb. Funny enough, <laughs> this is actually a problem that's remedied by a second playthrough. Because if you have a wiki open, you can just avoid doing all the dungeons that aren't worth it. But on a first playthrough, the one ah, that's the best it. and the most memorable, you don't know what all of these have. So if you're like me, you're probably going to do all of them and get pretty burnt out on fighting the same little statue fuckers in these pieces of shit. For the most oh, part, the enemy and boss variety on display in Elden Ring will blow your back out most of the time but seeing <laughs> unique experiences that you've cherished like the reveal and Bro, like how many unique enemies and like move sets are there you know like like if the statue bro is one and then like that blue floaty dude is one like how many unique enemies are there because if it's like a, in a couple of hundreds then i'd say that's a that's a good fair amount of enemies to you know discern between 
spectacle of fighting Astel, natural boy of the void. Get copy pasted into a separate dungeon or fighting a Aww. godskin fucker, both of them for like the fifth time. It's a bit disappointing. The nice uh, thing about Elden Ring, though, is that you technically yeah. don't have to do most of this. If a boss is too hard or if an area is too annoying for you, you have so many other options of things to do and bosses to fight and places to see. But this also potentially leads to some issues with the game's design. Previous Souls games that had a more linear progression path could quickly halt your progress with a super tough boss. And you would have mm -hmm. to either grind enemy mobs for souls to level up or just slam your head against a wall until you hopefully eventually break through. Elden Ring being mostly non-linear actually remedies that problem and finally adds a sort of difficulty slider to the Souls games. If a boss is giving you a swirly, just go do something else. Maybe find a better weapon, learn some new skills, or spend time practicing your parries against weaker bosses. I don't know, there's a lot of stuff you could do. Then once you're better prepared, head on back to that boss that was f***ing you up and say, it's opposite day, you slug. Huzzah! Oh, that's pretty amazing, right? This makes the yeah. game so much more accessible and less intimidating to a new player that's never been beaten to death by a rat before. But yeah. the system of sort of choosing your own difficulty could also potentially rob you of a compelling experience. This game is yeah. so goddamn big that there's bound to be stuff in the early areas that you won't find until way later in the game. I mean, but to my knowledge for Elden Ring, is there is there's not there isn't like an obvious uh like difficulty slider or whatever in the game right you just start the game boot it up and you just start playing or whatever i i'm pretty sure there's no uh like difficulty choosing i know i think i understand that like like the basic understanding is that if you use a sum like summons on a boss that's essentially like uh what was that it, it, it's like putting the game on like easy mode or whatever like using summons so, yeah. And when you do find it, maybe it's a super awesome, unique boss battle with like a really cool reward that you beat in like two hits. In some cases, this feels amazing. It fully feeds into the power fantasy of wanting to make the biggest fucker alive and can be super satisfying to just totally fart on a boss that once had you breaking two by fours from Menards over your leg. Yeah. But sometimes it can feel- Bro, I will say it's the same feeling that remember in like world of warcraft uh what was it in tbc or no was it tbc no in outland or whatever uh there was that big like reaver green reaver thing that just walked around and like as you're leveling up um and you don't know like if you're playing like with the sound off and you just listen to whatever music and by the time your screen starts shaking you're like the thing is already behind you and he just comes up and like smacks you or whatever and you're like oh fuck maybe i should play with the game sound on ah nah never mind i'm not gonna but then you know once you reach like level 70 or like or at least once what i did uh, like i reached level 70 and i made like a party to go take that fucker down that gigantic green reaver i did this like a bunch of times like back in the day when it first came out and every time I was like, ah, fuck you, you stupid mob. And uh, yeah, it, it felt good doing that. Underwhelming and disappointing. I think the fact that the game doesn't have level scaling for enemies is much better than an alternative where it did. Because level scaling can often make a game world feel pretty artificial and your progression feel pretty meaningless. But yeah. I do think there's a world where you could have a bit of both. I think if you visit areas in the game that you're very obviously over leveled for, the game could maybe flash a little prompt that says, hey, do you want to make this fight scale to your level to maybe make it a bit more? satisfying and maybe we give you extra runes as a reward for upping the difficulty i would love that mark brown of game makers toolkit like a, makes a great point in his like video idea. about how hollow knight actually changes the layout of early areas and ups the difficulty of enemies to keep things more challenging and interesting later in the game and i think that's a great example of something that elden ring could have potentially done as well speaking of rune rewards for defeating enemies holy shit they are all over the place in this game and mm. make 
make like zero fucking sense. Donkey talks about this in his Elden Ring video and I wholeheartedly agree. Like the difficulty of an enemy does not correlate to how much money you get for defeating them. It's honestly really? ridiculous in a lot of cases. <laughs> also, let's talk about respecking stat points. Once you defeat Rinala at the Wizard Academy Raya Lucaria, you unlock a way to use specific larval tier items to reallocate all of the stat points that you've spent money on. And this is amazing. This means that if you find a weapon or spell that you really fuck with but don't have the stats for, you can retool your character to be able to use them and switch up your playstyle and experience one of the many amazing builds that you can do in this game. So why the fuck can't you do the same thing with weapons? Elden Ring offers uh... no way of transferring or respecking weapon upgrades from one weapon to another, and it makes zero fucking sense to me. Okay, so I, I get this whole thing. Like, you like the game so much that you want to add replay value to it by, you know, ditching the respec cost for yourself and then ditching the respec cost. I guess you can, like, spec your weapons out or whatever. I don't know. Never played the game. But I think that's it. What it does is it adds uh, play time to the game. And I think that's fine. Um, yeah. And also, there was a thing that he mentioned earlier I forgot to talk about where it was like trying to increase the difficulty to get like some extra rewards or whatever um I think that's also fine um because like the main examples that I would use at least for like PvE content is like for Shadow of the Colossus once you beat the game you could go back and do like time trials for for each of the Colossus or whatever you know like your guys all leveled up he's got like the best weapons or whatever and then I think, what was it? Each time trial, you could unlock like a new weapon or something or like an upgraded version of it or something like that. And I did that and that felt really good or whatever. But the sad thing is that um, there was no like in-game leaderboard type thing. You know, if you if you wanted to do that, you, you, you had to like go through like some websites or like post up YouTube videos or whatever. Or another game that does that really well, like adds replayability is the monster hunter uh genre um so you know once you play like for monster hunter world for me was like the first monster hunter game i played through like from beginning to end and it was awesome um i stumbled upon the speedrun community and how cool it was um but they had their own like gripes with the game or whatever like the game didn't support speedrunning really um a lot of the the things that it sounds like Jakey is talking about for Elden Ring. Sounds like the like the issues he's bringing up here sound similar to the issues that were were happening in Monster Hunter World. Um, and I think like it's like if you beat the game once, you should unlock like speed run mode or whatever. You know, in speed run mode, you have like you have like infinite respects, infinite like whatever. Um, you have like an in-game leaderboard. And, you know, like, was it, there's like boss rush mode or something. Um, yeah, because in Monster Hunter, there was like, was it like 16 weapons? And there was like a category for each weapon for each monster. So there was like a charge blade versus, I don't know, what was, what was, what's, what's like the, the dragons or whatever. Um, there was like, you could do the dual blades versus the dragon, the, uh, the katana versus the dragon, the, what was it? The, the, the bow, uh, like in so on and so forth. But you had like 16 categories of each weapon. And all you had to do is just take down that mob as fast as humanly possible. Um, and then because it wasn't weapon versus weapon, like to determine who does it, like the absolute fastest, it was like, there were so many categories, like you could do the fastest dual blade the fastest uh great sword the fastest hammer time and those were all separate categories for this one mob but then you had like a couple hundred different mobs that with all the different weapon classes so that's like seemingly infinite like replayability right there so i think that's like really cool like a really cool concept that like rpg type games developers like they don't really um they don't really account for that like that end end game 
you know, the people like the diehards that like start to carry the game genre or whatever. Like the content after the main game. So I I, I don't know. I think I think uh, like a lot of devs could probably benefit to you know listening to the community and adding this like extra shit like I don't know six months after the game comes out three four or five months I don't know. You find so many fucking cool weapons in this game, and it is a total pain in the ass to make switching to them actually viable. Right. Yes, you can find the smithing bells that let you buy an unlimited amount of upgrade resources from the merchant, but A, what if you don't find some of those bells on your first playthrough where you're mm -hmm. not looking stuff up? And B, I don't understand what the harm would be in letting you get back some of your upgrade resources from a weapon if it meant that that weapon went back to its base level, right? You yeah. would be so much more excited to find shit even if it's something out of your typical wheelhouse. The Resident Evil 4 remake, which is fantastic by the way, I talk about it on my... Yeah, once the main game is beaten, just let the... like unlock a new mode where you just let the player play how they want. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It adds a lot of replayability to your game. Second channel, Jaquan the Jeek will like, subscribe, rate, comment, <laughs> five stars. Let's you sell weapons you've upgraded back to the merchant and you get most of the money that you've put into upgrading that weapon, which is amazing. Dang. So why can't Elden Ring have the same thing? Another thing that can feel so ass- Well, I don't think they were really considering that. They, they, they weren't, I don't think they were really expecting people to like the game so much, maybe backwards and outdated are the NPC side quests and how you progress them. These games have always had super convoluted NPC side quests and I know it's partly because Miyazaki knows that with the internet everyone's gonna get together and figure it out so you can afford to make it complicated and whatever. I, I mm -hmm. get that. But I still think that some of these more basic ones should be doable by just using your common sense. It's one thing to have NPCs not progress their dialogue or do something until you go rest or leave the area when it's a smaller, more linear game but it's an entirely different thing to have that same bullshit in a massive open world game where people are supposed to move around from place to place but will never do it while you're watching them so you gotta go rest at a bonfire and then wait no wait i messed up you gotta rest again to load the guy in because it's not nighttime if you rested and then died and then came back like what the f i went where the f told me to why does this require so many other extra unseen steps i only bitch and moan about this because the writing and voice acting in this game is so so good like so heartbreakingly good and because the storytelling and lore bits are so few and far between you'll fucking chase after whatever scraps you can find but at the end of the day i make these videos to criticize the things that mm -hmm. i love video games i love them so oh. so so very much and i love elden ring more than most other video games i am so eternally grateful to be alive in the same timeline that from software is i mean there's nothing against them coming out with like elden ring 2 uh, the, uh, 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 the new electric boogaloo or whatever and they include all of uh all of your things or whatever you know there's nothing that says they can't do that so maybe cranking out games of this quality. Elden Ring is not only a continuation of the Dark Souls franchise, it is an evolution of is From boss? Software's trailblazing game design. A design that I think defined the last 10 years of gaming, and with Elden Ring could very well define the next 10 years of gaming as well. A massive journey with some of the most beautiful vistas I've seen since Ooh. Windows Vista, and some of the most <laughs> challenging, grueling bosses that I've taken on and overcome since Windows Vista. Thank you to Hidetaka Miyazaki and From Software for taking a chance with Demon Souls. Thank you for making some of my favorite games ever made. And thank you for watching this video. Nice. I'll see you later, gamers. Don't get off the ball. Oh, gotta get the stretch. Gotta get the stretch. <laughs> Rat love. Bro, that was awesome. Um, like I got, <laughs> I have a lot of the, the Souls-like games in my, like my Steam library or whatever, and I have Elden Ring in there too. Um, I just, you know, I'm, I gotta be in the mood to play it or whatever, you know? Like, I want to play it. Um, and all the DLC that, I think there's DLC for it or whatever, but, you know. 
yeah, this is just another another video hyping up Elden Ring for me. So, I mean, I'm excited to play it eventually. So, yeah, I thought this was a great video. Um, yeah, and I want to see more from Naked Jakey. So, yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. That's all I got to say. And uh, that's it. All right. Take it, you guys. Later.